So welcome everybody to Energy Matters, uh, another interview. I am really happy as always that you're joining us to hear uh, from different perspectives about what energy is, how we use it, how we think about it, how, what we want to, what do we want to know about it. And today I couldn't be prouder or more honored to welcome Solala Towler. He was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1950 and came of age in the 60s when he first got involved in Eastern philosophy and practice. He has studied Taoism for over 30 years and published The Empty Vessel, the Journal of Taoist Philosophy and Practice for 25 years. He's had 14 books on Qigong and Taoist philosophy published, including Tales from the Tao, which is a wonderful book of stories, uh, Taoist stories, Practicing the Tao Te Ching, 81 Steps on the Way, a brilliant book that takes the Tao Te Ching and makes it very personal to you. Um, mm -hmm. And he's taught Qigong and Taoist meditation workshops and seminars all over the country. In addition, he regularly leads groups to study Qigong and Taoist meditation in the sacred mountains of China. He's a founding board member and past president of the National Qigong Association. I followed oh, his hey. footsteps being on the board of directors after he had left. Um, mm -hmm. He also leads Taoist tea ceremonies and is the <laughs> author of two books on Cha Dao and the Way of Tea. Mm -hmm. Also a musician. He's an artist. He's a, he didn't mention this, but he's also a wow. photographer. He's recorded four CDs of meditation, relaxation, movement, uh, using large Tibetan bowls, flutes, harmonic overtones, singing, and group chants. So, Solala, I am so happy that you decided to say yes and come on <laughs> to this program today. It's always an automatic yes with you. <laughs> Whatever it is, yes. <laughs> well, thank you for that. that I mean, we were commenting before we started this that we have the same background, so it looks like we're in the same room, but I'm actually in Oakland, California. Yeah. And Solala, you're in Eugene. Oregon. Yes? yes. Yes. So um let's let's just begin by um what your definition of energy is. You know, and one of the things I want to say to folks is this man, you know, it's really truly an honor to be with him. He is such a profound scholar, so deeply knowledge knowledgeable about um the way about the Tao. so um when you when you when people ask you well what is this energy thing right a lot of people think it's just getting up out of the bed and having enough energy to get through the day yeah what well that's mean? part of it it's for um, sure <laughs> the chinese word for energy like the practices we do is qi but there's a lot of different we think of qi as when we're doing qigong or vital life force but in chinese i don't remember the phrase right now but the weather is a kind of qi and they say, what's the weather going to be like? It's something chi. The chi we get from the food we eat is named gu chi. There's a lot of different kinds of chi. Um, and to me, chi has a kind of intelligence. Mm. So it's not just some arbitrary thing when we're waving our arms around the right way, we get more chi. Um, you know, we live in a sea of chi, just like fish live in an ocean. And we have specific pathways that chi moves in our body. And many times when feel, people feel they have no chi, it's because their chi is blocked or they have disease or pain or something. Somewhere in that pathway, there's some chi that's blocked. And that's what the acupuncturist, the qigong healer, the qigong practitioner tries to do is unblock that. But chi is also the energy we put out to others. Mm -hmm. You know, the warm, loving energy I get from you. It's a kind of chi, right? It's a kind of energy. Being able to explain something to someone else is a kind of chi. Being able to show loving uh, to our friends and loved ones is a kind of chi. It's a kind of energy. It's basically all energy. And even matter, we know, is vibrating at a certain rate. So it's what we think of as matter is also a kind of energy. So I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it's, you know, it's it, what I love about it is it's sort of like where the sort of spiritual concepts of energy and science come together, right? Especially in the development of, you know, as as quantum physics becomes more and more deeply um, explored, that there's there's that sense that these, these, this artificial split, because they used to be one, right? So this artificial split between spirit and science are kind of coming together. And part of that has to do with an understanding that, everything all of our surroundings and who we are like you said we're like fish in the sea we are in a sea of chi or like robert peng says you know that i am in chi chi is in me you know he always oh, had beautiful 
chant that he does. So, so, um, so, so how did you, how did you first start to under, what was your entry into this? Because you're so knowledgeable and you're so deeply steeped. How did you enter into this? Probably in the sixties, you know, we were into expanding our consciousness, you know, and I had lived a very sheltered, neurotic, had very few friends, never went on a date, you know, I didn't go to the school prom. My picture wasn't in the yearbook. And it was taking LSD has opened me up that there's worlds beyond what I'm living in right now. And wouldn't it be fun to live in those worlds as well? So and that was 1968. And it wasn't any Taoism or even Tai Chi back east that I ran into in Boston. So I did yoga, did meditation and Hatha yoga. Now there's a zillion kinds of yoga. Back then it was just like Hatha yoga. Right, right. Yeah. I yeah. So Hatha Yoga was your, one of your first entries into a world beyond the neurotic environment that you said. Yeah, neurotic, <laughs> into the erotic, the consciousness <laughs> erotic life. Yeah, I did, was interested in Zen, read the wonderful Paul Rep's book, Zen, Mind, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. I'm from this town you mentioned, Lawrence, and I found a book in the local library by someone from the town right next door to me. I come from working class French Canadian Roman Catholic. This guy was also French Canadian working class Roman Catholic. His name is Jack Kerouac. <laughs> and he wrote he wrote a book called Dharma Bums, where he talks a lot about Zen. And he wrote, he made up a lot of stuff apparently, but he wrote a lot of stuff about Gary Snyder, who was a very serious Zen practitioner, who was like, wow, there's stuff like this in the world? Zen, yoga, meditation. Wow. You sound like you kind of, kind of felt like a kid in a candy shop. Like, what would you grab next? Yeah. Right? And, and I did. I was studying Zen like 34, 35 years ago. I studied Zen. But there was something about the rigidity of Japanese form of Zen, uh, which actually has its roots in a Chinese form of Buddhism called Chan Buddhism, which is Taoist Buddhism. And, uh, and but the Japanese society, it tends to be a little more rigid. And so there was something I didn't enjoy about that. And then I was in a bookstore in Portland, Oregon, and found a book by this guy watching me. And it was like coming home, you know, he was talking about high spiritual matters, but also be emotionally independent. Don't lean on others, do your own work, take your own, create your own karma, things like that, that really appealed to me. What yeah. And then, Tell me a little bit more about, about about what was going on for you that that appealed to you so much. You know, do your own work. And what, what, was, it that, yeah. what was it that was the hook for you? Well, I was very ill at the time. I had been sick for 10 years with chronic fatigue syndrome till I was totally bedridden. So how old were you when you were this sick? Mm, let's see. Well, 33, 35 years ago, and I'm 72 now. I'm not good at math. <laughs> so we're in your 30s, probably. 30s, okay. And I had three <laughs> children, and I was going to acupuncture school, which I had to draw about it, but I kept the children. Fortunately, I had a wife who could help. And uh, and I, when I was reading about Taoism, and I, no, first I was studying, working with Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine, the only thing that worked for me. And I started thinking, what what's the fault? philosophy behind Chinese medicine and it's Taoism and then I found that book and then I found a Qigong teacher and and a Tai I found a Taiji teacher who was Chinese who was a Taoist which is very very rare in this country and mm -hmm. he and I became really good friends and I'd go visit him at his house and stuff and is this um started... is this Chung Liang was it Chung Liang no, no no David Chang like a local guy in Portland <clears throat> yeah um yeah, I didn't meet Tung Young for many years after that, but um, but it was a combination of Chinese herbs got me out of bed, and then Qigong is what cured me. I studied Qigong with a woman from Beijing who was living in Portland, mm -hmm. called Soaring Crane Qigong. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and she wasn't not a Taoist. She was, you know, she was just a beautiful, loving grandma, and just said she is love. We do Qigong so we can get stronger so that we can pass that love to other people so they can get stronger and pass that to someone else. That was her whole philosophy of Qigong. What a beautiful entry into it. What a, mm -hmm. And it just seems like it so fits you, right? It so fits your values and where you were coming from in this exploratory. Yeah. yeah. It must have been very demoralizing to have chronic fatigue in your 30s, right? That's sort of a young man's 
you know. Well, it was also a time where doctors didn't believe in it, didn't even think it was a disease. They still don't really know what it is. They think it's an autoimmune disease. But I've been very sick with infectious hepatitis, amoeba, histolytic eye, and giardia all at the same time that I got from living way out in the country and drinking out of a creek. And so that I got over all those, but I never was healthy again. And I just kept going further down. So mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in this stuff. I've seen it, it saved your life. People. It saved your life. It actually it gave literally you literally saved your life. Yeah. That's so profound. Yeah. Well, and so watching me is 102 now. So I haven't seen him in many years. I went to a New Year's celebration though online with his two sons, Maoshing and Daoshing, this past weekend. That was really nice. And we did a little ceremony with Dao, and then Mao told us about the coming year. And the thing that Dao said that I remembered is that stayed with me is that. You know, we have New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. China has two weeks of New Year's. Right. So he said the first seven days is about letting go of things that are constricting us, patterns, behaviors, foods, perhaps, you know, things that are holding us back. And the next seven days is bringing in new healing, new new medicine for ourselves. Oh, that's so helpful to know. Isn't that nice? Today is Thursday, today's Thursday right? So started on so it started on Saturday, Saturday or Sunday? Uh, the 22nd on Sunday. Sunday, yeah. So, goes, so, yeah. It goes from the new moon to the full moon. Right. Because it's a lunar calendar. Right, right. So, um, and so did they give you information about the yin water rabbit? Um, Just saying it was going to be a much softer year. Really good year for traveling. Really good year um, it for um, looking for new mentors. Things like that. It's going to be a much less crazy tiger a year. Yeah. And you're a tiger, aren't you? You last year. No, I'm a tiger. You're a tiger. Well, I actually had a good year. Yeah. <laughs> but my partner, Shanti, is a rabbit. Oh, oh, good, good, good. Yeah. So, so she's, she's like super sensitive, you know, and you know, our friend Ted Sibick. Yes. Who's very high level to me, very high level to you and healer. And he, she, she came to one of the conferences and met him, and then she went out, the, out, and he said to me, oh, she's a deer, meaning not that he could see she had deer-like, like, you know, not feeling safe in the world necessarily, mm. so he, even though she's a rabbit, but rabbits are pretty flighty too. <laughs> Yeah, they, they 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 tend to move fast. I, yeah. I also know that they're you know that they're fertile, and I think that some yeah. some of the people that I've talked to have talked about how this is a time where creativity can really you know mm -hmm. it's not just about how to make children. It's create cre what what are the creative projects that you can do that a lot could come forth at this time. And the yeah. other thing I heard that was interesting to me is that this is a birthing time for new, like you said, mentors or new leaders to come up, which is seems like something we could really use these days. Well, we had a couple of years ago, rat, which is associated with plagues, and we started a worldwide plague. And then the year of the tiger, it, things were really kind of shaky and China invaded Ukraine. And now we're in the year of the rabbit. So hopefully things are going to even out now. Oh, from your lips to God's ears, as they say. Yes. You <laughs> <Yes>. say. <laughs> <Hear that>? <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Well, I know one of the vehicles that you use that I think is so effective. I, I um, I'll be want to let people know that I take a, a class with with Solala that um he's going to talk about in a little bit uh, on the Tao Te Ching, but um or the Tao Te Ching, um I but that that uh, one of the vehicles that you use um when you are talking about some of these this ancient wisdom that holds so true for these days is through storytelling um and, and as you know that's a big passion of of mine it's something that i think is is just um, one of the most effective ways to deliver information and messages you know as i always love that quote, i love that quote by maya angelo where she said that people will forget what you did they'll forget what you said but they'll never forget how you made them feel and i always think that stories Ooh. are a way to make people feel so right. so talk a little bit about the stories uh, cuz you've not only taken Taoist traditional or i don't know if traditional is the right word but ancient Taoist stories but you've also written stories in the tone of Taoism so yeah. talk a little bit about that process that creative process for you well, it's kind of like you were saying earlier, I think that the way that people learn something, the easiest way and clearest way, the most inspiring way is through a story. 
instead of now we're going to quote from this text and you know that kind of thing some people like that i mean i enjoy that but <laughs> stories you know stories it's like one of the earlier forms of communication right people are sitting in the cave well what did you see today when you were out hunting or you know what happened to yeah yeah and then they would act it out because people perhaps didn't have the language facility we have now so they would act it out and that's where theater dance song ritual ceremony storytelling it all comes from the same place yeah so i think when you use stories you're clicking into that super ancient paleolithic if not before realm yeah and the stories i share are two thousand years old and sometimes they're only a couple paragraphs so i've kind of open up the narrative and then I get inspired and do some of my own too. So I have two books of those. Yeah. Oh, you do? What What are the, the yeah. one is Tales There's from one the One called More Tales of the Dow. More <laughs> Tales from the Dow. I That's the one I published and I, I did that one in a tea book and I thought, okay, when I go to NQA and all my conferences and workshops in the country, because I, I always sell a lot of books and I brought them out and then COVID hit. So they're, yeah. still, they're still sitting here. Uh, well, I'm going to order one after we finish this talk, so <laughs> you'll be able to have one list. <laughs> well, you know, this tea thing you mentioned, because that's another really unique thing in Taoism, a little bit in Zen too, but this thing of tea as a meditation, as a spiritual cultural path, doing tea ceremony called Gung Fu tea ceremony. I have a tea room in my house that Shanti and I sit almost every day and drink and pour. And we invite people over to, to share with us. And very simple ceremony, things I learned from Wu Jung Shen, from another teacher of mine in Taiwan. And this is so different from a Zen tea ceremony, which I know is Zen very- tea ceremony, again, that rigid, you know, I love Japan, I love Japanese people, but there's a rigidity there. And their ceremony is really long, very formal, no joking around. People, everything, every movement is prescribed. And Chinese is very different. We, we're doing the little cups of tea, but it's a lot more, there's a lot more going on. It's, it's much easier. You tell stories, tell jokes. Find out what's going on in other people's lives. And I have this beautiful big thing, a calligraphy that our friend Jinya Zhang did for me, um, which is a phrase I learned from Wu Zhang Shen, which is in my tea room that says, um, oh boy, it, it means savor tea, discuss Tao. Mm. And, the, and savor is three mouths, a character for savor. So it's, instead of just drink, you'd say drink, cha, drink tea, you'd say he cha. But this is savor tea, pin ming. Ming is an ancient word for tea. Uh, pin ming lu cha, lun cha. Discuss Tao, or discuss how you're feeling. You know, just, you know, we do that. And I've done it at NQA conferences for like 80 people I'll do a tea ceremony. Yeah, yeah. That's a great way to learn and, and teach about Taoism and spirituality and culture. Yeah, there's something about savoring tea that, um, you know, I have never done this with you. I look forward to the time when I can, but, yeah. but something about that savoring tea is also savoring our lives, right? Because it's about laughter and connection and interchange and checking in and all yeah. of that is part of the ceremony that you you lead. Yeah, yeah. it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. It is, and we drink this real weird tea you know, dried hard cakes of tea called poor tea that a lot of people in the West have no idea what that is, but it's a very healthy fermented kind of tea that we drink. Mm. Is it you pungent? Would how much tea I have in there. Yeah. That much, much tea. <laughs> it's different, has a slightly different character. Yeah. And so one day we might want this tea, another day we might want that tea. Mm. That's how we do it. Yeah. yeah. So, so I don't, I, I, I know that you're still recovering from a, a cold, um, but I, so I don't want to keep you forever, but of course I do want to keep you forever. Um, but I, no problem. Uh, um, I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the two classes that you have. I know you have one that's starting oh, yeah. tomorrow and another one that's starting on Monday. So let, let's talk about the two classes and what they are. And yes, one's tomorrow and one's when, next Wednesday. When there's sort of yeah. these ongoing classes that one on Tao Te Ching, and you mentioned I wrote a book called Practicing the Tao Te Ching, which was published by Sounds True, really great publisher. And when I told them what I wanted to do is I wanted to give the translation of the 
Lautz's work, a commentary to explain what it means, and a practice for every one of the 81 chapters in the book. So they're simple Qigong meditation lifestyle practices. And we do this all in the class, which has been going literally like three and a half years since before COVID. So that's every Wednesday. And we're, we, I'm on my fourth time through the book. And I have one person who's been there from the very beginning. And so different people come in and out and we do it on Zoom. So if you miss one, you know, we just send you the video. And the one on Friday, is more it's an hour and a half class the Wednesday is one hour and it's more like I just get to pull from different Taoist strands and that one's called free and easy wanderer right free and easy wandering yeah it's from uh after Lao Tzu who wrote the Tao Te Ching the next most important and highly amusing uh, teacher of ancient Taoism named Zhuangzi uh which his book is full of stories and riddles and crazy stuff and he had this phrase the, uh, he called it the, what is it, the, the highest level of lifestyle for a spiritual person is free and easy wandering, he called it. So it's not just like I have my goal it's, and it's fine to have goals, but I'm not, I'm not going to shut everything out except for that goal. And if I don't make that goal, I'm going to feel really bad about myself. It's more like, no, wander. What is it Shanti always quotes? I don't remember who it's from, but he who wanders is not lost. Not everyone who wanders is lost, something like that. Mm. And being free and easy about it. I always associate that with the watercourse way. Is that correct to associate? Watercourse the... way comes from Tao Te Ching. Yeah, but I was thinking free and easy with the wander. I always think, of, you know, when I think about watercourse way, I kind of think, you know, that image of somebody sitting on a water buffalo, just kind of moving <laughs> <laughs> along. I always think yeah. of that as kind of a free and easy wandering. Yes, I was. I had took a, a thing from one of my teachers this weekend, and he said an old Taoist phrase of push the boat and then go with the, with the current. It was like push the boat out and then just go with the current. So you have to take that first step. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the, to me, when you say that, it makes me think of how you have talked about Uwe. Because because you've talked about that, you know, the whole concept of non-doing. You want to, actually, I won't say it. You you go ahead and talk about that. But that uh, idea of non-doing doesn't mean not doing. Yeah, yeah. It, it really it's like the basic to me core principle of all of all of Taoism. Uwe means not doesn't mean not doing. It means not overdoing, not overextending, not pushing the river, not stressing yourself out, and always find a way for things to just create themselves naturally. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of great artists, they when they're gonna paint, especially if they're in kind of abstract, like a Picasso or something, they're not like deciding what it exactly is they're gonna do. Or someone who plays music, um, you know, you, you shared with me, your father was a composer and musicians, especially, I have great respect for jazz musicians and Indian classical musicians, because you don't decide what you're going to play before you play it. You discover what you're going to play as you're playing it. And that's a lot of way, watercourse way. And the first step is to take an action, right? They, they pick up the instrument yeah. and then it unfolds. So that, yeah. that pushing the boat and then going with the current is just a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. And practice. And practice. You know? When you first start learning guitar, okay, the G is like this, and then a D and a C, and you're really conscious of it. Where are the notes on the piano you're playing? And after a while, you're just, you're not thinking, oh, now a D, now a G. How do my fingers go? Where is this going to take me? You yeah. just do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm an improviser. Uh, I, I'm in, you know, I do a lot of improv. Oh, you know. I especially love love this. Um, so, okay, so you've got these two courses. One is uh, Free and Easy Wandering, and the other is on the Dao De Ching. And, and basically what yes. you do with that first, the second one, the Dao De Ching, is you, that you, um, you, have, you, you're, uh, you're, you teach one to two chapters every time, and you yeah, just choose a book. So people are starting at whatever, wherever we happen to be in the course of yeah. it, starting with that particular chapter. But it's, yeah. I always think of it as kind of a circle, so you could kind of enter it. it time right? yeah. doesn't matter where where the start you don't have to start with chapter one it's not linear one to yeah, one. yeah. but yeah. as people come in and out they're coming in at different times and then the yeah. one on friday we do and, and we do a little more concentrated qigong kind of stuff 
and I'm drawing from other things like Zhuang Se and other Taoist teachers watching me and not just Tao Te Ching. Yeah. I try to keep it to Tao Te Ching, although I quote people like Zhuang Se. And, and one of my favorites, Hu Xing Gong, who's the old man who lives by the river, is mm. what his name means. And, you know, Taoism has a lot of these, just like Zen, has a lot of these eccentric teachers, mm. eccentric, <laughs> who teach in a, using riddles and koans and aphorisms and coming from behind or coming from a, a direction you're not expecting. That's a big thing in Taoism and Zen. Mm. And Chan, Chan is a, a Taoist Buddhism. And in life. <laughs> and in life. And if you, you can be open to doing that, yeah, you know, you said you love improvising. A lot of people are very frightened by improvising mm -hmm. and they don't even want to improvise anything in their life. This is my job. This is what I eat. This is what I'm looking for in a partner. You know, nothing's improvised. Yeah. And and their life is more stilted that way. In any place along the line where something doesn't work, they're totally thrown. Yeah. Because they can't go with the flow. Yeah. They don't know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh learning these practices with you is one way to to cultivate that ability. So what I'm going to do, Solala, is I'm going to put the links to join your courses um, in the show notes so people can then click on it and learn more about what it is and, and register if, they, if they're drawn to. Um, and it's always recorded on Zoom. So if, like, say you wanted to do it, you're hot to do it right away, but you can't come tomorrow. It, I send you the link to the video. Yes. And all of them are videotaped. So people want to look at it again or they, I, there are. Lots of people that come to sign up for these courses that never come there in in person. They just yeah. watch the videos. I have the same thing with my Qigong classes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so this has been so helpful. Is there any last word that you <laughs> want to say to people before we close for, for today? Yeah. Um, let me just say that the world of Taoism, which is probably the least understood of all the Asian philosophies, People know about yoga and Zen and stuff, but people have no idea that Taoism. They think it's a kind of Buddhism, but really it's universal. Tao, the all that is, the, is the primal mother, the great mother. It's the same Tao for everyone. We have the same energy system as the ancient Chinese. You don't have to be Chinese to do Qigong. They, they work on you just the way they have for thousands of years. And you don't need to Another thing I think is important, you don't have to, uh, what's the word, decide, what, uh, what is it when you're trying to get someone into a new religion? Convert. You don't have to convert to be a Taoist to do all these practices. You know, you can be Jewish, Catholic, you know, Sufi, you know, that, that doesn't matter. What matters is just what, what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. And we're talking universal truths that everyone around the planet I, I acknowledges and understands and it's just we put this label Taoism but it's really nature yeah you just call it nature yeah that's right that's right okay well thank you for those words um I'm gonna close till the next time folks be well let the chi flow okay. thank you so much for joining us yes thank you all out there in, in uh cyber Dao. <laughs>